Hello, everybody. This is Shane Kavanaugh with the GFOA. I'm happy to introduce you to the, our webinar today, COVID-19 Forecasting for Finance Officers. We're going to go ahead and get started. We still have a few people logging in, but I think we can proceed. So I'd like to begin by welcoming our two presenters. We have Douglas Hubbard and Matthew Miller. Um, Doug is the president of Hubbard Decision Research. He is the author of a number of acclaimed business books. These books have sold over 150,000 copies in eight languages and are used as textbooks in dozens of university courses, including at the graduate level. And there's two books that I think maybe are of particular interest to us here in the GFOA. And the first book is How to Measure Anything, Finding the, Intent, the Value of Intangibles in Business. This book is one of the all-time best-selling books in business math and is required reading for the Society of Actuaries exam preparation. Another book is The Failure of Risk Management, Why It's Broken and How to Fix It. This was also on the Society of Actuaries exam prep reading list at one point, making Doug possibly the only person with two books to have been on that list. In addition to his books, Doug has published in prestigious journals like Nature, as well as publications like the American Statistician, CIO Magazine, Information Weeks, and Analytics Magazine. Doug also has experience with government. He's been at the GFA conference to present before and has worked with federal agencies such as HUD, GSA, the VA, EPA, Office of Naval Research, Census, OMB, and the Department of Treasury. He has also worked with the state of North Carolina. We're also joined by Matthew Miller. Uh, Matthew works with Doug at Hubbard Decision Research. For the last eight years, Matt has used quantitative tools to guide organizations in dozens of industries, including cybersecurity, oil and gas, pharmaceuticals, IT, mining, and many more. And prior to his management experience in consulting career, he was a hedge fund manager specializing in algorithmic trading, commodities, and macroeconomics. He also played the cello for the Seattle Symphony. So we run out of time or slides on today's webinar. We know how we're going to fill the rest of our hour. And most importantly for this webinar, Matt's COVID models have won praise since January, and his COVID projections have been consistently among the best in class. So I think we've got a great panel here today to talk to you guys about our topic, and I'm going to turn it over to Matt and Doug to take it from here. Thanks, Shane. Uh, thanks, Shane. This is Doug. And Matt, I guess we'll start. All right. Well, hi. I'm delighted to be here with this group. Thank you for taking some time to be here with us today. Shane, uh, thank you for your collaboration and help setting this up. And Doug, uh, as always, it's an honor to work with you. So let's get started with the table of contents. We start with our track record. We talk a little bit about our method, how we do it. Um, you know, COVID's a hot topic. So we have a lot of material to present today. So we're going to be running and gunning and trust that you have the slides, and so afterward, if you want to review, we can make ourselves available for questions by email. So there's a lot of material here. The third, uh, third item is talking about a, a safety metric. I'm thinking of it now as kind of my favorite metric in terms of <clears throat> when to reopen, making that call, and then also leading indicators of resurgence. And then finally, a topic on interpreting COVID news. Hopefully we'll have time for the Q&A session. So let's just um, dive right into it here. So we'll start off by making the case why you should bother listening to us at all. There's a lot of voices and projections out there. And you know we've run into that from the very beginning. <laughs> One of the most common uh, responses I get from clients and potential clients is, you know, there's a lot of people that have an opinion about COVID. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at our past track record um, and then show a comparison to other models with our um, most recent forecast, which is also up on the GFOA website, right, Shane, that's on the dashboard now. So we have a, a forecast for the USA for 30 days. Um, before we get into it, though, I want to make a quick meta comment here that we'll be using some acronyms, and I just want to cover two of those real quick. Um, CFR means case fatality ratio. So that's essentially how fatal the disease is, how many, what percentage of people uh, die. And the other acronym we use a lot is NPI, which stands for non-pharmaceutical intervention. That's a mouthful. 
Um, and a non-pharmaceutical intervention is anything from anything, any policy action, essentially. Um, so anything from discouraging large groups to closing bars all the way up to a complete lockdown. So you'll hear those, and I just want to make sure that um, we cover what those are ahead of time. All right. So here we start off with, um, basically we go, we started the analysis of COVID way back in January. And um, I'm actually in a strange position of having been, well, I think one of the most vocal watchmen, watch persons, um, to, to basically advise acting quickly and decisively with travel restrictions and quarantines. And it's saying, you know, this is a big deal. Um, and being conservative and saying things to clients that they didn't want to hear. And now I, I tend to be kind of going the other direction, that I'm one of the more sanguine voices out there in terms of reopening risks. That's not to say that I'm completely sanguine, but uh, it's an interesting point to be in because I've, I've sort of flipped a little bit. But early on, we were warning caution all the way. And so you, this is a slide here from um, early March, March 6th, where we're basically making the case that, uh, that COVID is in every major city already. <clears throat> and we said that because if you compared infections in Italy, which we, which we forecasted, and then looked at the international air traffic, which was data, um, you can see that there's going to be, what did I say, two to 600 times, 200 to 600 times more seating from Italy than from Wuhan. So we were advising quarantine almost two weeks before it was enacted. Similarly, we were enc uh, encouraging caution with our clients and policy action uh, in the U.S. weeks before it became law. All right, uh, Doug, you want to take this slide? Yeah, go ahead and pass me the ball there. So uh, Matt's been doing this for a while. I'm Doug Hubbard. And uh, one thing that we do in our models is we're always measuring the performance of the models themselves. So uh, as Matt was making a series of forecasts all the way back to Wuhan and the Diamond Princess cruise ship and you know, several cases since then, we were tracking his original forecast and how he actually did compared to observed outcomes. And uh, the first 20 sessions, there's actually quite a few more now, but out of the first 20 specific forecasts he was making for some future date, 18 out of 20 fell within his 90% confidence interval which by the way is exactly what you would expect in a 90% confidence interval. You would expect 10% to fall outside of your 90% confidence interval. That's a way of, if you're not familiar with it, that's a way of expressing your uncertainty about a forecast. How wide is your 90% confidence interval? Well, this is very well calibrated, what we were observing in all of these initial uh, estimates. So um, let me show you another item here a little bit more about the performance. This is a forecast for cumulative U uh, US deaths since April 22nd. And the red line shows the actuals. The dot, the dashed curve shows the upper and lower bound. And of course, the, the solid blue curve is uh, Matt's best estimate. And what you see is the actual is basically splitting it right down the middle. That's what we're observing here. Um, and this is actually uh, uh, doing pretty well even compared to other major models. In some ways, our model is simpler than some of the other models. I think that actually is an advantage, but there's a lot of data on several other models. So I'm showing here the University of Texas, the Institute for Health uh, Metrics and Evaluation in the uh, University of Washington um, and Columbia U. And the green lines in each of these charts are their forecast from the same day. So this is April 21st, April, actually April 22nd. Um, and again, the red shows what the actual outcomes are. And you saw that, you see here that University of Texas um, is uh, a little bit below, the, the, um, uh, the actual data is above their upper bound by a little bit. Columbia, the actual data is right on their lower bound. And uh, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation um, they just have a much wider range. So there's a lot more uncertainty in their range. There are also models from MIT and Los Alamos, but they were not actually doing forecasts as early. So I was just looking at the earliest forecasts here to see how well they did. 
And there are some models that even have much wider error bars. They, they wouldn't even fit here because the, the error bars are too wide on the scale of this chart. So actually, uh, Matt's models compare very well with all of the other models, they, it, at least as good or arguably better. Uh, so we look at the actual measured performance. That's why we always we try to measure the performance of the model itself. So I'll give this ball back over to Matt, I think. And that summarizes really our performance at uh, forecasting these things. So great. Thanks, Doug. So now we'll, we'll talk we'll, for about three slides here on methods. And we talk about a basic metric, kind of our, our favorite, favored metric in some sense from, uh, from the beginning of the analysis back in January. We'll talk about some of the components of the model that we uh, most frequently use and then talk a little bit about how um, additional estimates are made within a model when the research or statistics are either not available or um, flawed. Okay, next slide. So deaths, this, this slide has a fair amount of uh, information on it, but um, basically deaths are the best metric for where infection was, and in some sense for where infection is. And it's not that deaths are a perfect metric, because as we all know, we do get restatements. We do find um, old cases of deaths, or for example, when France added, uh, <clears throat> added all the deaths from their retirement communities. Uh, that was a discontinuity. But generally speaking, deaths are a consistent metric, meaning if you look across all the various states, the way that the states measure deaths is fairly consistent. Additionally, uh, the restatements happen, but they're not, they're not as large as, as what happens with testing. So the other, um, the other obvious piece of data we have are confirmed cases. And we'll, we'll talk about that later on in the pitfalls section. But we chose deaths. The, the issue with deaths is that it's not a picture of the infection level today. It's a, it's a picture of the infection level 20 to 25 days ago. And it depends where you are in the infection cycle. Early on, it's more like 20 days. Later on, it, it lengthens to 25 plus. But this gives us a good first pass at how infected and risky any given region is. So it isn't surprising to see states like New York and New Jersey near the bottom of the list but it might be surprising to see the magnitude of the differences. All right, so this, um, what I wanna focus on here is, is the, the graphic at the, at the bottom there. And that shows basically a, a, a visual of how exactly the model works and how we go from current reported deaths to an estimate of current infections or even current and future infections and level of contagion. And so there's that, that um, acronym I talked about. CFR stands for case fatality ratio. And basically, if you just take the range, so there's published estimates for ranges of the CFR. And if you just divide the deaths by the CFR, you get to an estimate of infections, right? Infections times case fatality ratio would give you deaths. So deaths divided by case fatality ratio gives you infections. But it's not infections today, right, from the last slide. It's infections. Um, 20 to 25 days ago. So from there, you need to do a little bit of math. And basically, you're taking that number, that range really at that point, you've got a range of infections from 20 to 25 days ago. And we're doing this in a Monte Carlo. So the date is part of the Monte Carlo. Um, but you move that forward, that period of time to, to the t uh, current time. And the way you do that in terms of how the infections are growing or shrinking is it's based off of non-pharmaceutical interventions. What is the level of non-pharmaceutical interventions and how have we seen those uh, NPIs perform in other regions and other cases? We kind of have an idea of what exponential growth is when there aren't any NPIs. We kind of have an idea of what that baseline is. Um, and, then, and as time has moved on, we've been blessed in a sense in the U.S. to have a lot of other examples of, of countries that are ahead of us. Obviously, Wuhan in China is a major one, but then we have Western countries too. Italy, Spain, and France are all ahead of us in the disease cycle. And we'll, we'll give you a graphic of the disease cycle if you're not familiar with that here in a couple slides. But the bottom line is you can, you can basically make a calculation of how infections from 20 days ago translates into current infections 
using data on the region itself and also error bars based on data from other regions and other examples of NPS. So that's, that's kind of a mouthful, but that's really, that's the bottom line behind the whole engine. Um, and I think a lot of the reason we've had as much success as we have is because we're looking at, I, I was looking a lot at uh, Italy, France, and Spain early on. And I continue to look at them as, as examples. So we look at other regions, but a lot of it is looking at the, the error bars from the examples of countries that are in front of us. Okay. So we do, um, I also have a link there that I have a note to share. If you're interested in the, our first article, my first article on um, COVID, um, putting the link there in the chat. And that's um, estimating infections in Wuhan back in January. All right. So the final piece in our method that we're going to talk about today <clears throat> that we have time for is the, the idea of calibration. And when possible, we use uh, research-based estimates. Uh, but we also use a simple Bayesian approach and we'll adjust our ranges based on subjective informed estimates where appropriate. So what that means is if we think data is biased, for example, in one direction, we might use a subjective Bayesian approach in that case. Or we might look at um, data sets that don't go together, but you can use the, you can use human intelligence essentially to come up with a, um, a calibrated range based on, uh, based on, it can be quantitative and qualitative descriptions of things. So where, wherever possible, <clears throat> we're using research-based numbers but then we do also use calibrated estimates. Now, calibration is a skill. It's a skill that can be taught in about three hours. And Doug, do you wanna just uh, mention a couple things about calibration? Yeah, it's, it's we've trained uh, over 1,500 people in the last 20 years or so. And uh, there's about 85% success rate or a little bit higher. Uh, that means that about a little more than 85% of the participants are statistically indistinguishable from perfectly calibrated by the end of the training. And the reason this is important is even if you do have to use subjective estimates, you still need to measure the performance of the individual providing the estimate. And this is what we do in all of our models. If there's any point in a model where somebody provides, a, say a subject matter expert provides a subjective estimate, uh, which by the way is sometimes the only way you can do it, you still have to measure the performance of that individual at subjectively estimating uncertainties and probabilities. In fact, that's what a whole branch of statistics is about. Uh, we, it's called Bayesian methods. Uh, Matt briefly mentioned that. So you do have to use Bayesian methods if you're trying to uh, compute the probability of various outcomes. You, you have to rely on those methods. And without going into further detail, often the inputs for Bayesian methods are before you actually even gather data. So it does rely on initial subjective estimates. And of course, when you gather more data, the weight of these subjective estimates eventually you know, dilutes quite a lot, it goes away. Uh, but at first you start with these initial subjective estimates, but just like any other measurement instrument, you have to calibrate it. In this case, calibrating the subject matter expert. Uh, and I'll just say that all, all being calibrated means is if you tracked all the time that you said you were 90% confident, like for example, Matt here is producing a series of 90% confidence intervals for his forecast. If you tracked all the times that Matt said he was 90% confident, about 90% of those cases turned out to be true. And of all the times he said he was 60% confident, about 60% turned out to be true. Now, research shows that that's not where most people start. Most people start out as statistically overconfident. They are not right nearly as often as you expect to be if you look at their actual track record. So it's an important consideration to have to use in any modeling approach. Yeah, uh, this it, it, seems to be kind of rare, actually, that people. I, I, I just, I just really want to give credit that that I think calibration, this tool, which is part of the Applied Information Economics uh, uh, toolbox that Doug came up with, really helped me in terms of uh, getting out uh, estimates before other people. Right, because if you can use if you can use yourself as an instrument as a calibrated instrument, then it really does free you up a little bit, right? And and the and the 
the test of whether you're successful or not comes down to are your ranges right as often as you say they're right and how narrow are they, right? Those are the two tests. So ultimately, the proof's in the pudding. And uh, anyway, I'm a big fan of calibration, so I always, I always um, uh, try, to, try to get people interested in this. All right, so let's move on to our first poll question. Um, and I'm going to have uh, Shane, is it Dan who? Okay, it's already launched. <clears throat> so, uh, Dan or Shane, you want to just uh, let me know when, when to go on? Sure. Yeah, and, and then there, there's a question here if you can, yeah. or if people would like to put that one more time. Okay. Case fatality ratio, I believe it was, Matt. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing the question. Uh, so oh, just re please repeat what CFR stands for. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, case fatality ratio. All okay. right. Okay. All right. Well, cool. Simply the of the of the people who were infected, what percentage of them uh, died as a result of the infection? That's that's the CFR. All right. Well, Ben, why don't we go ahead and close the poll question and we can move on. And it looks like most people got it, <laughs> which is good. All right, great, thank you. So next we're switching to um, a metric I've just recently developed um, and I think I'm, kind of promoting this as the best metric. I'm well, not kind of, I am promoting this as the best metric for decisions in reopening the economy. Uh, by the way, how is my um, volume? Can you all hear me okay? Any issues with the audio? Yeah, it's fine, let's go, great. Okay, great. Okay, fine, Matt. Yeah. So we'll talk about the disease cycle, I referenced that. And then, and also how is that different from the level of contagion? So the metric that I'm, that I'm uh, promoting here is I'm calling level of contagion. And then we'll, we'll look at an observed reopening and finally give some bottom line uh, conclusions. So, uh, let's see, deaths, uh, as I said in, in the first slide, reflect how contagious the population was 20 to 25 days ago. And so that's useful as a starting point, but it's not necessarily going to reflect how contagious the population is today because NPIs and the effectiveness, again, non-pharmaceutical interventions, um, and the effectiveness of those NPIs varies. Uh, confirmed cases is a more um, contemporaneous, I guess that's the word, um, measure. So that's, but that's still, you're generally talking about a lag of 12 days. And there's an additional issue there, which we're gonna again come back to in the pitfall section, which is that those results can be conflated by changes in policy for testing. And policy for testing really can stand for a lot of different things. The most obvious one is more availability of testing. But it could also be that uh, populations get targeted successfully for testing. So the problem with looking at confirmed cases is that as policy changes in testing occur, you might be not seeing a true signal about the level of infectiousness you might just be seeing more efficient um, finding of cases. And that's a real issue with this. Again, when we talk about the pitfall section, we're gonna present some, some uh, interesting slides on the diamond princess and uh, asymptomatic cases in different age groups. Uh, so really, we need to come up with a method for determining the level of contagion. Ultimately, um, what are we most interested in? Let's go on to the next slide here. Uh, what are we most interested in um, when you're talking about reopening an economy, even a region? What is it? What are we really concerned about when we're when we're having that debate? I would we would um, we would say that what you're really concerned about is future infections, right? Given how many infections there are now, given how many contagious people there are now and given how people are interacting to create more infections. 
And so the thing that informs that forecasted level of infection best is not uh, cases 12 days ago, which may or may not represent all of the actual cases, right? Confirmed cases, you might be capturing 4% of them, you might be capturing 40% of them. So it's, it's, you need a better metric to start with. You need something to help forecast that, that level of contagiousness. And so what we do, what we've developed here, is you start with, again, with deaths per million as the proxy for level of contagion 20 days ago. We're going to use a range in the CFR, so we, we, uh, we now have a, a range of infection 20 days ago. And then we're going to look at how did each state do since the lockdown began. And the way that you do that is you look at how quickly did the, um, the exponential growth in cases and deaths start decaying. So how, that, that's a proxy for how effective their lockdowns were. And there's, um, I don't really have time to go into the, the, all of the math with this. I'd love to show you the spreadsheets. But you can see that uh, some states are far better than others. So at the top of the list is New York. And let's take a look at these states over here now on the right. It might be surprising that New York is halfway down the list, right? Is anyone surprised? Now, remember the deaths per million, they were more toward the bottom. They were fourth or fifth from the bottom. Here, they're right in the middle of the pack. Well, the reason that is, is because their decay rate in terms of exponential growth is, um, is the highest out of all U.S. states. I think uh, Michigan was next. Um, uh, Wisconsin's toward the top. So that matters because uh, with deaths, you've got 20 days of intervening time where that, or actually more like 25 now, where that um, level of infection is coming down that whole time, right? And so if you look back at, at just the deaths, you're going you're gonna to get a skewed metric. And so this combines that. And what you're seeing here is um, a lower bound and an upper bound generated with Monte Carlos for each state. And so taking Wisconsin at the top, 0.05 means there's not, you know, 0.05 per thousand. So that's, uh, what is that, 50 per million uh, for a lower bound and uh, 310 per million as an upper bound. So uh, intuitively, this could be thinking of if you're just walking around in public, what's the chance that you bump into someone at the grocery store who currently is uh, not only has COVID, but is contagious with it? That's what we're trying to capture here. Okay, and again, the range is, is pretty dramatic. So between Texas and Connecticut, you're talking about a, a difference of 15x, right? So, so um, and this, this leads me to one of my more important points that I really like feel passionate about communicating, which is it, it really does matter where you are. It really does matter. And, and the county data is even more um, delineated, more stark. It's more striking. That the, that the difference between uh, counties could be in another order of magnitude, uh, higher or lower. So this is my favored uh, reopening metric because I think it really captures what you're interested in terms of um, what you're interested in in terms of forecasting infection. I want to come back to I've referenced the disease cycle, and it's related, but it's not the same. And you you may have seen um, a graphic like the one there on the left that uh, Morgan Stanley publishes a disease cycle estimator like that, um, and they. There's a three, you know, three parts, early development, acceleration, and recovery. And there's different places each state is in terms of recovery. And what I've done, or what, what we did just recently, is we came up with a mathematical equation so we don't have to guess where states are. We now have an equation that tells you where you are. And all it is is basically it's the negative log of the ratio of recent daily deaths divided by total, total deaths. And that gives you if, you, if you do the negative log of that, it gives you an intuitive number, basically zero to eight on how far along the curve you are. The higher the number you are, the further along the recovery curve you are. Okay? And so, anyway, I think this is a, a useful metric as well. This is one that really, Matt, really uh, points out the difference with New York right now. So you might look at the uh, you know, reports in New York with the high concentration of infections and deaths and so forth, but they're decelerating the fastest, right? They're, they're decelerating the fastest and they're the furthest along. And the they're the furthest along, yes. That's right. Yeah, so both. I don't have the, um, I don't have the numbers for the, um, 
decay in uh, exponential growth, but New York tops that list too. It's a negative 0.085. That's, um, and I think Virginia was at the bottom of that list. It was a negative 0.022. So New York's decay is four times as fast as Virginia's. In fact, um, New York City is probably becoming one of the safer, and I know this sounds uh, crazy to say, but it's probably becoming one of the safer um, cities to be in in the U.S. If you look at the New York City websites and you look at the number of cases they have, daily cases and daily deaths, it's pretty dramatic. It's pretty clear that they are um, very quickly, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very positive story. And this is a subset of all the states, Matt, right? So you, you focused on the states that had the highest, uh, you know, cumulative. Uh, deaths. Cumulative deaths. So it's a mixture of like the biggest state, uh, states in terms of population. Yeah. Times, um, you know, how infected they became basically. So we're going to go on now to uh, some reopening material, but I want to be clear before we get off the disease cycle thing, that the contagion metric is really much more important than where a region is in their dis disease cycle, right? So New York is a, is a great example. They're the furthest along, but they're in the middle of the pack in terms of contagious index. So this previous, um, this previous table is the one that, that I would use. So New York is right here, 0.4 to 1.4. Um, and it's because the magnitude of their cycle was so much greater than other states that even though they're further along, they're still uh, medium, you know, me middle of the pack in terms of um, contagion. Uh, Michigan is further along in their disease cycle than Wisconsin, uh, as another example. But their level of contagion is is still three to five times as high as Wisconsin. All right. So uh, Doug, I'll pass the. Bob, to you here, you can talk about the next couple slides. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so uh, we wanted to show you an example of an early reopening. Um, it's not exactly a, re a reopening, but it's a related idea. Um, we're looking at the primaries uh, in Dane County, Wisconsin, where people have this, you know, standing in the line, right? Now, we're always telling our clients, you have more data than you think. They're waiting for some ideal you know, defined set of data, but if we're resourceful, there's actually a lot of other indirect indicators of something that we're looking for. You have more data than you think, and when you do the math, you often need less data than you think. This happens all the time in all statistical analysis. So this shows a little bit of the disease cycle. We're estimating daily infections in Dane County, Wisconsin, as a percentage of the population. And you'll notice they are well on their way back down. The, the dashed lines, the dashed curves, again, represent Matt's 90% confidence interval, with the solid curve being his best estimate uh, out of that group. But right there in uh, it is April 6th was the primaries. Okay, so they decided to go ahead with the primaries in Wisconsin. And what you see is there's a little bit of a bump right after that. In fact, what you observe is that the um, that bump, that increase, uh, was within the time to contagious if infected on 4-6. So if, if you had a group of people that were infected on 4-6, when, when would they have started to show uh, that they were, uh, when would they have started to show symptoms and when would they start to be contagious? So you see uh, infections start to increase right away, right at that point. And they're really pretty far down on the, uh, the curve at this point. So um, it, even though they're pretty, you know, they're pretty far down the curve when they went to uh, primaries and people stood in line, you can actually observe the uh, spike a bit. Okay. I should also Doug, mention that the, the Y axis is as a percentage percentage of population. Yes, uh, it's a percentage of population. Yes. Right. Yeah. So here's just a, uh, some important observations out of any of this. It doesn't matter when you reopen, uh, you're going to have some effect on where you are in the disease cycle. If your infections don't increase, it will at least be the case that the rate of decrease will slow down. Your deceleration will be less. So that's going to happen. Um, there, at any point in time, if you reopen, there's going to be some additional, uh, either, either additional infections or you won't uh, reduce infections as quickly as you would have otherwise. So, uh, and that happens regardless. So the real question is, is when should you do it and what are the trade-offs for when you should do it? Um, there are some practical logistical trade-offs 
you know, uh, you don't want to reopen uh, at a rate that would again overwhelm, say, healthcare, right? So, uh, could you do it in a way? Could you pace it out in a way? And this is part of what we would forecast, even for individual companies or uh, counties or municipalities, we could forecast these things. So, how would testing affect that? How would contact tracing uh, affect that if that were implemented in advance of the reopening, right? So, you could just turn the lights on and reopen and um, uh, not have enough testing and uh, not even be tracking these things and really cause a bigger problem because uh, I'm afraid what will happen is that somebody will reopen and then have to shut down again. And that's really the worst of all, all outcomes here. So you're not helping the economy, you're not helping fighting the disease, etc. So here's a criteria that you really need. No matter what your strategy is, you're still forecasting outcomes. When somebody says, the the disease the cure is worse than the disease or the disease is worse than the cure those are forecasts and we should look at them as forecasts and we say all right so if you started uh, relaxing rules about say restaurants uh, being closed or say uh, hair salons uh, etc other business other businesses if you started reopening those what's the forecasted outcome if somebody says um, uh, well it that won't be it won't be bad. Let's document that. Let's record the forecast, just like what Matt and I have been doing here. Record that forecast and see how good that forecast is, because you are making a forecast, whether you intend to or not, about the outcomes. You're saying that the if you decide to reopen at one point in time, you're saying that the uh, economic benefits of reopening outweigh the uh, cost of reopening too soon. That's a computable strategy, by the way, that you don't have to guess at those things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, anything else there, Matt, that you would add? I think that's it. No, that's, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and this is something else, uh, you know, uh, Matt, you'd put this together actually uh, to uh, demonstrate how much of a lay indicator deaths really are, right? Yeah, and, and because I didn't, I didn't label this very well. Um, so let me just explain. We got daily deaths, daily confirmed cases. This is a simulation. It's a best estimate simulation. So this does not indicate 90% um, confidence intervals. That's not what we're looking at. We're just saying if New York City reopened everything on, on May 14th, or not everything, but they do some sort of phase reopening, how would we know? How would we know if it's going okay or if it was a mistake or, you know, how, how would we make that determination? And so we, we're taking a best case, middle case, worst case. Best case is basically it, it doesn't affect the um, decrease in the decay at all. That's a little unrealistic, uh, as Doug was saying. We're going to see some sort of bump. Middle case, I chose as my middle case something akin to like Sweden or South Korea, because as I was saying, I am somewhat sanguine that we can, we can, um, we can reopen intelligently. So the question really is, how well are we doing at that intelligent reopening? Are we able to match Sweden and South Korea where we observe their economies being open and yet an R naught of slightly less than one? So what an R naught, um, how to say this? That, that um, cases continue to decline, albeit very slowly. So that, that would be our middle case. And the worst case is, uh, no, it doesn't work. Like people are going, let's say everything reopened and people just resumed business as usual, that also is not realistic. So the question is, but it would, it would not work and we'd have an exponential growth in cases again. So the question is, how do we determine it? And there is going to be a lag, but the, the confirmed cases is going to give it away faster than daily deaths. We don't want to wait for daily deaths because it takes three weeks before you'd even see um, even the smallest um, difference between forecast and, and something, something bad. So if you're forecasting the middle case, how do we know whether we're on track or whether we're doing better than expected or worse than expected? And that's where, uh, Doug, um, a statistical tool like the one that you, uh, you recently created comes in handy. And I, I'm not trying, um, that sounds salesy, but, um, how do I restate that? Um, we, there are statistical tools that, um, that can tell you, okay, which of these paths are you more likely to be on? Because the issue here, guys, is, or, ladies and gentlemen, 
is that there's, uh, there's lots of noise in these series, right? And so these, these are going up and down, up and down. So how do we know whether it's just the signal or the noise? How do we know if we're going up that worst case scenario, you know, two weeks into it, or if it's just a bad day? Well, there are statistical tools that, um, that can tell you that you're closer, you're more likely to be in the middle case or you're more likely to be in the worst case or somewhere in between. So that's the takeaway there. The other takeaway that I'd wanna stress on this is that I've already said, uh, confirmed cases will be detectable before differences in deaths. If you have an aggressive testing policy, such as such that you're saying basically anyone who's symptomatic at all, we want to test you, come in right away. If that's your policy, most places it's not. If that's your policy, you're going to buy a few more days in terms of detecting which path you're on. If you're in that worst case or a bad case scenario and you have an aggressive testing policy, you will buy yourself two or three more days of, of um, of time in terms of when you can detect it. Um, and then maybe just as important, or if not more important, is that municipalities or, or regions should try to maintain a consistent testing policy before and after, just to reduce conflating factors. All right, so that's, um, Doug, did you have anything else you wanted to add on the warning side? Uh, there's one other thing to add. I think for a lot of you, um, you know, when you look at the, availability of different levels of these precautions, you know, the vaccine is going to be a lot later. Um, but prior to that, you've got testing. Uh, testing is a uh, great mitigation as well. And even prior to testing, um, you, you have the antibody tests. And those are actually more available than the test for COVID-19. Uh, so um, obviously, if somebody has the antibody, it's less likely that you have to give them the the COVID-19 test. I would only do that then uh, as a statistical test for, you know, uh, do, do uh, people uh, start to uh, uh, express this again? This, does this virus begin to express again? The, the theory is, is that if you have the antibody, you would generally not uh, ever be uh, infected again. Uh, that's the current theory, and that's a testable hypothesis. So um, if, if you have a hard time getting your hands on tests, um, you know, try antibody tests. I'm, I'm differentiating between the COVID-19 test for COVID-19 itself versus the test for antibodies. Uh, okay. So you can find a lot of sources for those antibody tests. People are selling those uh, right now um, on mass, and it might be more feasible. That would be at least a backup in consideration logistically for rolling out lots of solutions here. Great. Thanks, Doug. Okay, Dan, would you, uh, would you launch that second poll question, please? And while you're doing the poll question, I will just say that um, I really do believe, well, maybe I'm an optimist. I was not optimistic late January through early March. I was, um, I was a Debbie Downer. I am optimistic that, um, that there is a solution here. Um, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Sweden, all in different ways give me uh, reason to be hopeful that uh, through intelligent policy um, and good execution, we can we can uh, have the best of both worlds here. That we can actually reopen our economy and uh, maybe not extinguish COVID, but keep it at a, a very low level. So I'm I am currently optimistic. And then why don't you let us know when we've got the um, poll done there. Looks like Ben has closed it. So Matt, if you want to continue on. Okay, great. Yeah, and we've only got 14 minutes left. So in the interest of uh, getting to q and I'll, I'll try to get as quickly as possible through these uh, interpreting data slides. Okay, so there are some issues that, that come up in terms of data and news. The most, uh, the biggest one really has to do with testing. I've already alluded to that. Um, there are some differences in demographics that I think are, are fascinating just as their, their own, uh, kind of their own subject. And then restatements and revisions. So um, let's start with the difference in demographics. And the main takeaway from this slide, we've all heard that 
that uh, older people are more at risk. But I think it just, it bears stating that the difference is orders of magnitude. So a 40 year old, if you look at this, is, is 100 times more likely than a 50, 15 year old, one five, to die from this. And a 90 year old or an 85 plus is likewise 100 times more likely uh, to die from this than a 40 year old. So it's really extraordinary in terms of um, the range of case fatality ratio. Um, the Diamond Princess was something we wrote about and made predictions on early on. It also functions as a really interesting, um, almost like a controlled experiment, but it was, it's, it's very interesting in terms of everyone on that ship got tested, right? And so we, have, we can draw data out of that that we might not be able to draw. And I encourage you to, to look at that um, Science Direct article. We've got really, really, really fascinating um, metrics on there. We pulled some of those out, and one of the things I think that um, that was the most surprising to me was the uh, age groups that were most likely to be asymptomatic. Asymptomatic means uh, not displaying symptoms, so not just mildly sick, but literally no symptoms at all. Um, and I had uh, uh, erroneously thought that it was people uh, below the age of 30. But it's actually people below the age of 20 and then older people. So it's the, the people that are least likely to be asymptomatic are young adults, uh, 20 through 50, roughly. And you can see that there's the, um, to, to explain what those gray bars are, it's based on sample sizes within the Diamond Princess. And so there's uncertainty based on uh, how many cases there were. You can see that the uh, 70 to 79 year old age group. That's toward the bottom there. That's the narrowest gray um, bar. That's narrowest because there were the most uh, most cases of um, uh, of COVID in that age group. So, but it, it still presents a really really interesting um, a picture of who who is asymptomatic. It's 60% of 70 to 79 year olds will not display symptoms. Well, uh, that, that to me was very surprising, um, but that was that's what the Diamond Princess data showed. That as of time of testing, um, uh, you know, 50 what is that, 55 to 64 percent roughly were asymptomatic in that age group. Uh, it also one other quick note here: um, younger adults were also less likely to catch COVID. Now that could have been because of different ways of behavior on the boat, but I just thought it was worth noting. Any, any, anyone under 50 was roughly half as likely to catch, the, to catch COVID as people over 50. So there might be some, not immunity, but just um, a, a less, what's the word, um, less likelihood of catching it given the same exposure. Um, so I feel like we've already talked about this. Um, availability of testing differs not only over geographies, but over time. So the same area is going to have, the same uh, region is going to have different levels of testing at different times. And as I stated toward the beginning, lack of availability understated the seriousness of COVID early on in our communities. And increases in testing run the risk of overstating or understating progress in fighting the infection. And as an example, I just pull, I go back to Dane County here. Um, we were talking about that Wisconsin primary. And you see that bump. Um, well, let, me show the, let me show the next slide. You see this bump in confirmed cases right here. The, the orange line is actual confirmed cases, right? So we're coming down very nicely here. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's this big jump up. Well, where did that come from? Right? That, that does not match any sort of predicted decay. Um, it, it, it was a um, it was a surprise, right? If, if you didn't know the primaries were there, and you didn't know more testing capacity was there, this does not fit uh, uh, exponential decay in, in cases. So something happened. Um, but if you look into it, it wasn't just the primaries. There was also an increase in testing. So you see this jump up on the same day that 17 people uh, were confirmed. There was a, a three or four times as many tests. These are uh, moving averages here. 
So there, there represents a, um, there's an embedded change in policy or change in availability, I'm not sure which, in testing. And so the, the issue that I'm trying to get to here is that you can misinterpret confirmed case data very easily. And so that is, um, that's a metric that I look at with suspicion. And it's in the news all the time. And I hear from my friends and loved ones that, oh, you know, such and such a place had the most confirmed cases yet or in three weeks or whatever. And I look at, the, I look at those reports with interest, but there's also a modicum of, um, I don't want to say suspicion, but I, I, I want to know, I know that it could be conflated with a change in testing policy. So that's a pitfall to be aware of. All right. Um, so final poll question, and then we can go to questions and answers. Uh, well, while we're doing that, um, people can see the poll question on the side, so we could actually get started with Q&A while we wait for this to go through, if that's all right with you, uh, Doug and Matt. Absolutely. Um, yeah, cool. sure. We have a couple questions. Um, question one, is your CFR the same as an epidemiologist IFR? Uh, no. Um, the uh, case, the, the, the difference is uh, denominators. So the case fatality rate has to do with the uh, a, a, a estimated number of infected people being the denominator, and the numerator is actual deaths. All right, you're very good. All right, and then if folks have other questions, just use the QA feature that we have on the WebEx interface to send your questions over. And while folks are doing that, another question here for the disease cycle scale on slide 16, you referred to New York being at four times level, how does the scale work? So I think that's a question on the scale. And we can always go back to slide 16 to show people that um, graphic so that everyone's following along. Oh, sorry, you know, um, did I say that back? Um, Case fatality rate is generally uh, deaths divided by confirmed cases versus estimated IFRs, estimated infectious. I, did, I just described those backwards. Um, I think epidemiologists I use think. both. Yeah, epidemiologists use both. They're, uh, it's not like one uses one is used by epidemiologists, not the other. So, uh, go ahead, Matt. Well, uh, so what was the question on the uh, slide 16 again, Shane? Sure. So referring to the disease cycle log scale, you said New York's is four times the level is the question and looking to figure out what that means in terms of four times and how does that work on your scale? Hmm. Okay, I don't I don't remember saying New York was four times. Well, maybe just a, a review then um, how New York fits into this. Versus the other slide. Oh, okay. no, now I remember. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think I think that they're probably referring to the difference between 10 and 15. So 10 is slide 10 or slide nine rather. New York is is down here near the bottom. It's not fourth. It's fifth from the bottom. And this was because um, 25 days ago or 20 to 25 days ago. They were the fifth most contagious region. So if you're looking at deaths per million, that's a good snapshot of where we were 20 to 25 days ago. But because they've had the most effective uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, they find themselves in the middle of the pack in terms of contagious per thousand. Does that answer the question? Um, well, let's see, questioner, if that did not answer your question, let us know um, in the meantime. Um, Here's a question for you guys. Um, so, um, Matt, you're talking to elected officials, right? And they're very kind of this is a very emotional issue for a lot of people. Um, what would you lead with if you were talking to a mayor and like trying to bring kind of some, we'll say, like sense of data and objectivity to discussions around this? What would you lead with? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, I think the first thing that I would want is to have a good picture of a quantitative picture of what the level of current infection is in my region. So if I'm talking to a mayor, you know, I alluded to this, that county level 
differences are even more uh, stark than differences between states. And so the first thing I'd want to know is I'd want to have a quantitative measure to be able to compare my region to another region. Now, um, it's really important also to not talk in terms of cases, but cases per thousand, because a region's um, capacities are going to be generally proportional to the number of people they have in there. So you can't compare, uh, you know, a, uh, a Dayton, Ohio with um, a town of 300 people in it, right? It's got to be uh, per million or per thousand that you're talking about. Uh, and then the next most important thing is talking about um, a, the two-pronged approach of coming in from above in terms of imposed lockdowns or policies, uh, policy practices, and at the same time attacking the problem from beneath in terms of testing, uh, uh, contact tracing when you do find infections, isolating people that are confirmed and quarantining people that, that are contacts of, of confirmed cases. So that, that's attacking, that's how you get at the clusters from the bottom. And that's really the key to taking it from a, a low level of infection to getting rid of it, like, like Singapore did back in February, right? So we've done a good job of the top down approach. We need to make sure in each area that we're uh, we're also developing that bottom-up ap approach of, of testing, contact tracing, isolation, uh, quarantine. So that would, those would be my, if I could only make two points, those would be my two points. Yeah, I, I would add, Matt, that it, if you can, be explicit about a forecast. Forecast what you think is going to happen with a particular right. reopening strategy versus a different one, if you did it earlier or later. It's so, your oh, forecast now yeah. Comes. That's a really good point, and that triggers. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you can forecast. First off, you can measure how good your forecasts were. You know, once you see what the outcomes actually were, but then you're more explicit about what the real trade-offs are. Um, I noticed actually there's another uh, Q and A question here later on about uh, doing budget forecasts uh, and the economic impact. Now we didn't do that for today, but that is the sort of thing that Hubbard Decision Research would do. Actually, uh, we we routinely get involved in economic impacts for a wide variety of problems from environmental policy to um, you know government policy etc um, in many different areas so we actually do do that uh, so uh, even if it seems though like uh, it might be hard for you to do internally a kind of a forecast you can at least write down what you think your assumptions are but for some of the larger municipalities you really ought to have somebody actually doing a forecast um, yeah, and that's the only way I want to deal with this discussion. Go ahead, Matt. I just want to piggyback on that. That uh, when you're doing a forecast, when you change policy, you're not going to see any difference. You shouldn't see any difference for two weeks, even with confirmed cases, and you're not going to see any difference with deaths for three weeks. So, right, what you see next week has to do with your policy from two weeks ago. So you can't pat yourself on the back for two weeks of continued good news when you open up your economy. It's on that 14th day is when you have to start being vigilant and saying, what do we expect and what's happening? And as I said, I, I tend to be on the more sanguine side, but I also, there's an important caveat in there, which is you cannot, you cannot self-congratulate yourself. You can't be self-congratulatory 10 days into a reopening. It's the period after that where you have to be vigilant. Sure. And well, maybe following up on that question then, uh, Doug and Matt, is like kind of we, go beyond like sort of the uh, statistics that we've talked about here today. And if you're looking to then translate that into broader economic impact, um, what sort of things would you suggest folks be looking at? Oh, for, for measuring their economic impact? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, well, first off, um, how much, you know, general GDP is usually a, a, it can be expressed as a sum of incomes, right? And the businesses that have been shut down, you often know, you have some information about how much they were making before. And by the way, you don't have to gather all the data. This is what sampling is for. That's what most statistical inference is about, is looking at a subset of the population to make an inference about the, the large population. But if you have your uh, chamber of commerce or somebody uh, do uh, surveys of businesses that were closed, 
Well, you know that those incomes went from whatever they were before to zero effectively, right? And in some cases, like what we did for Mother's Day, we, we picked up, you know, a takeout from restaurants, you know, that curbside pickup. Um, and so some are offsetting that. But uh, it should be based on surveys there. You know, ask the businesses what's actually happening when things occur like this. Are they losing business uh, when they're doing curbside pickups? Um, I think some of the things that we're actually doing may not actually have much effect on the economy. I mean, the fact that we're all doing more Zoom and WebEx meetings, is that really an effect on the economy? We're spending less time in traffic. Um, I, I think some of our habits will change in the long run uh, due to this. But uh, I think survey-based approaches for local communities, uh, you might, when you do the math, you, you're often surprised at how few samples you actually needed. You don't need, quote, all the data. You just need enough of it, okay? Um, I did that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. So kind of surveys and getting samples, of, you don't need to get everything, you just need enough that you can get a credible estimate based off of it. Yeah, uh, yeah, and you heard me, you've heard me say this before, it's when you have a lot of uncertainty is exactly when you don't need a lot of data to reduce your uncertainty, right? So if you've got a lot of uncertainty, you don't need many observations to greatly reduce your uncertainty. I think sometimes people intuitively believe just the opposite, but the math says if you know almost nothing, almost anything will tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like we should stop on that point. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, well done. All right, but there is one other question and I want to make sure we get everyone's in here. So um, this is a bit more of a technical one. Um, couldn't you account for increased testing by incorporating a moving ratio of the number of confirmed cases slash number of tests? Well, you broke up there a little bit, but I guess that's the one from uh, Lisa Williams, right? Can you say it again? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's the one by Lisa Williams there, Matt, uh, at 1.56 p.m. Um, couldn't you account for increased testing by incorporating a moving average ratio of the number of confirmed cases uh, slash number of tests? Uh, oh, okay. number of tests, I guess. Well, the fact is, is, well, I don't think you need to do that because generally you know your, something about your number of tests. You have to estimate the number of tests, right? So um, we, in, instead, we'd use the number of tests and the confirmed results to estimate something about the level of infection in the population instead of the other way around. So uh, uh, if you were asking that, I'm, I'm not sure. But you, you generally, the number of tests is not the thing that you have to necessarily uh, try to estimate. If you, you know something about the, uh, what the infection rate, what the confirmed case was before, and when you have 10 times as many tests and you uh, number of confirmed cases went up by a factor of 10, well, then you know how much of it was, was uh, attributable to the test increase. All right, very good. All right, and with that, I would like to thank our two presenters, Doug and Matt, for sharing their experience and excellent information with us here today. And I'd like to thank everybody in our audience for joining us, and we look forward to having you on a future webinar. And if you had any other questions, uh, you can just email us at info at hubbardresearch.com. I don't know if you can put that in chat or something there. Oh, uh, yeah, we've got, got our... Got yeah, there are emails right there, so you can you can contact us directly with those emails if you have any further questions. I'd also add to that, Doug, that um, if we get emails in the next couple of days, they stand a much better chance of response because I know we both get very busy at the end of this week. Oh, and guys, we had a couple of bonus questions coming here. Do you have a minute? Yeah, sure. I can stay on. Doug, I know you've got another call, but uh, I can stay on. No, not for a bit. Go ahead. All right, so first question is, uh, what are your thoughts about a surge in the fall as we head into a surge in the what? Fall. A surge in the fall. Flu season. Yeah, surge in oh, the fall. Oh, in the fall. Okay, yeah. Great. So, um, well, that's something we know a lot about uh, if, regarding, you know, we know something about other infectious diseases. Um, but we, our current forecasts haven't gone out that far. I think your furthest forecast out, Matt, is going out to when? Um, I'm forgetting it's, I'm uh, just doing 30 and 60 day forecasts so far. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, the 30 to 60 day forecasts are the most informative for actual, you know, policy implementation. Um, but you do need to forecast out of ways uh, to you know, really be explicit about the trade offs. Right. Um, 
So yeah, there there probably would be, as you would expect. Um, but you know, it's possible that people's behaviors uh, in terms of social distancing and the fact that people will just get used to wearing masks, which is a common in the culture in, in throughout a lot of Asia, uh, yeah. when people actually adopt that, maybe that'll uh, change. So that might be one of the reasons uh, Matt's a little bit more optimistic. Yeah, I guess I would lean toward the more I don't expect it to happen. Um, and um, I think it's because, uh, you know, the general's always fighting the last war. And so, I, I, you know, just in general, the more you fear something like this, I think the less likely it is to happen. Um, and we're going to learn a lot in terms of um, effectively fighting this disease in the next six months. I mean, this, I have a very optimistic stance on, on human ingenuity. We're just super adaptive. We're only four months into this, and we're very far along in terms of uh, the learning curve. And so I just think in another four months, we're going to be that much further along. And yes, warm, warmer temperatures help. Being outside helps because sunlight kills the virus. But fundamentally, um, this is a very transmissible disease. And if we don't act intelligently, we're going to have a second wave in the summer. So I think the takeaway from that is that um, there are going to be some cases of failure in the world and even in our country where um, it does come back, where there is a, a second wave. And I think it'll be before the winter. And so I don't, I don't see a big uh, fall or winter wave simply because I think we're going to get better and better as a culture at fighting this. So that's my, that's my two cents, but I don't have a high degree of confidence. I, I certainly wouldn't say I'm 90% confident we won't, but I lean that way. I'd probably go seven, uh, 65% chance that, that a winter wave is going to be, uh, I don't, well, we'd have to quantify it, but less, let's say less, um, less dramatic than a second wave during the summer. Something like that. Cool. Yeah. One, one worst case scenario that could happen um, Matt, is that after somebody reopens later on, it turns out to have been a really bad idea. They weren't ready for it and they had to shut down again. I think if that happens even once for like a whole state, uh, somebody who came on early, um, I, I wonder if that won't have some ripple effect in behavior. The fact that somebody was very optimistic about going on ahead and uh, not taking all the precautions that they needed in terms of having testing and contact tracing in place uh, as they're doing this, um, and then they had to shut down again. Um, yeah. That's sort of like the ultimate proof is in the pudding. That's like the ultimate measure of the performance of your forecast. They forecasted a different outcome and it didn't happen that way. I think if something like that happened, I think that'll have some effect on the behaviors of other states. Yeah, we're, we're running a, like a controlled experiment with 50 different um, trials simultaneously. Uh, so that's, I mean, <laughs> from, a, from a scientific perspective, I think that's, that's another thing I'm, I'm hopeful because we're going to have a lot of data. We're going to have a sense. Like if somebody reopens bars, for example, that's one that I'm, I'm hoping uh, bars stay closed for, you know, I think that's one of the more risky things to reopen, uh, large sports events. Uh, so some regions do that and we see a spike, then we'll know not to do that. Right. Uh, one other question here is part of the, um, guidelines are recommending opening of public spaces. Do you have an upper and lower bound you'd recommend as safe? I would, I would look at Sweden. I'd look at, so again, I'd look at what already exists out there in terms of practices and what kind of R-naughts are associated or what kind of decay in the infection rates are associated with different behavior. Because I, I think that's, that's better than um, guessing at it, is just looking at examples. Cool. All right. Very good. All right. With that, um, I appreciate you guys sticking around for our bonus questions. So I believe that covers everything that came in. I apologize if I missed something. Um, but again, that's it. And I want to thank um, both Matt and Doug for their time on the webinar today and everybody on the call for yeah, Th thank you, Shane. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Once again, I'm I'm really delighted to be here with this group, and uh, I'm grateful that you took the time to be with us today. I hope you hope you took something good out of the the session today. Yeah, thanks, everyone.